from Sand Hill Road in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's The Cube, presenting the People First Network. Insights from entrepreneurs and tech leaders. Hello everyone, welcome to this special Cube conversation. I'm John Furrier, host of The Cube. We're here at Mayfield Fund on Sand Hill Road in Menlo Park as part of Mayfield's People First Network co-creation with Silicon Angle and theCUBE and Mayfield. Next guest, Beth Devin, Managing Director of Innovation Network and Emerging Technology at City Ventures. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for coming in. We're here for the Mayfield 50th anniversary where they're featuring you know, luminaries like yourself. And we're talking about conversations around how the world's changing and the opportunities and the challenges can be met and how you can share some of your best practices to talk about uh, you, what your role is at, at City Ventures, what your, what your focus is. Sure, sure, and boy howdy has it been changing, huh? <laughs> it's hard to keep up with. I, uh, I've been at City Ventures about two years, and one of the reasons I joined was to stand up an emerging technology practice. City Ventures does a lot of work in corporate venture investing. We tend to be strategic investors for startup companies that are aligned with the strategy of City as well as our clients. We serve probably 80% of the Fortune 500 companies in, in the world. Um, but we also are a really important part of the innovation ecosystem at City, which is looking at how to drive culture change, broaden mindset, and really enlist our employees to be part of the innovation process. So we have an internal in incubator, we have a Shark Tank-like process we call Discover 10X. And what I really bring to the table with my team is monitoring and learning about and digesting technology that's not quite ready for commercialization, but we think it might be disruptive in a good or a challenging way for the bank or our clients. And we try to educate and provide content that's helpful to our executives as just the employee body at large. I want to get into a LinkedIn post you wrote called the Tech Whisperer, which I love. And we'll get in a second. Thank but you. you're there to identify new things and help un people understand what that is, but that's not what you've done. You've actually implemented technology. So that's you've been right. On the other side of the <laughs> coin. So in your career, talk about some of the things you've done in your career because you've been a practitioner. Yeah. And it, now and you're identifying trends and technologies before you were on the other side of the table. That's right, and, and it, sometimes I'll tell you I have that itch. <laughs> I, miss, uh, I miss the operator role sometimes. Yeah, you know, I feel so fortunate. I sort of stumbled on computer science early when I was going to school. And, and the first, I'd say, 20 years of my career were working in enterprise IT, which at that time I couldn't even have made that distinction. Like, why do you have to say enterprise IT? Mm -hmm. I was a software developer, and I was then a DBA, and I even did assembler language programming. So way back when, I think I was so fortunate to, to fall into software engineering because it's, it's like problem solving or puzzle making, and, and you with your own brain and, and sort of typing can, can figure out these problems. Then over the years, I became more of a manager and a leader and, and sort of got a reputation for being somebody that you could be put on any hard problem and I'd figure a way out. Uh, you know, tell me where we're trying to go. It looks naughty. It looks like not a fun project. And, and I would tackle that. And then I'd say I had some experience um, working in lots of different industries, which really mm. gave me an appreciation for, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we can all debate, you know, the role that technology plays in companies, but industries, whether it's healthcare or media or financial services, there's a lot of the same challenges that we have. So I worked at Turner Broadcasting before it was acquired, you know, by uh, Time Warner and AOL, and I learned about media. And then I had, you know, a fantastic time working at Charles Schwab. That was my first big financial services role when I came back to the Bay Area. I had, I worked at art.com, you know, where it was an e-commerce company. The first company I worked at where I was in charge of all the technology and we had no brick and mortar. And if the technology wasn't working, we weren't earning revenue. <laughs> in fact, not only that, we were really making customers angry. Um, and I also had a role at a startup, you know, where I was the third person to join the company. And we had a, a great CEO at a vision, but it was on paper. <laughs> and we had to <laughs> really figure it. out how to build this. And, uh, I was very proud to you know, assemble a team, get an office, and have a product launched in a yeah. year. 
So that so was you're a, a builder, you're a doer, when you've done assembler, decoding, hexadecimal <laughs> core dumps back in the day. Way back <laughs> when. Way back we when. didn't even have monitors. I'll tell you, it was a long time ago. Yeah, glory days, huh? Yeah. <laughs> back when yeah. we didn't have shoes on, you know, <laughs> you know and technology. What a, but what a change. I mean, you, you know. Yeah, huge the, change. The variety of backgrounds you had, and again, the Charles Schwab, I think was during the growth years. And, and, and the downturn. And you so had we got both sides. Both sides of that coin. But again, the technologies were evolving. Yes. To serve that kind of high frequency customer base. That's right. With databases changing, internet getting faster. APIs. More people getting online. We were early adopters. I'll tell you, I still will tell people uh, Charles Schwab is one of the best experiences I have, even though at the end I was part of the layoff process. I was there almost seven years. And I watched, we, we had crazy times in the internet boom, you know, going in 98, 99, 2000. I, I can't even tell you some of the experiences we had, even, and we weren't a digital native, you know, but we were one of the first companies to put um, trading online and to build APIs so we could have, you know, our customers could self-service and they could do that all online. We did mobile trading. I remember we had to test our software on like 20 different phone sets. You know, today it's actually so much easier. <laughs> it's only three. Yeah. Or two or one. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> Depending on how you look at it. That's right. And we couldn't even test on all the phone sets that were out then. Um, but that was such a great experience. And I still, that Schwab network is still people I'm in touch with today. And we've all sort of sprinkled out to different places. But I think, I don't know, there was something special about that company in terms of the what we learned and what we were able to accomplish. Well, you have a fantastic background. Again, the waves of innovation that you've lived through and been part of, tackling hard problems, taking it head on, great ethos, great management, discipline. Now more than ever, it seems to be needed because we're living in an age of massive change. Because yes. you have the, the databases are changing, the network's changing, the coding paradigm's changing, you got DevOps. You got the role of data. Obviously, mobile's clearly in, in, is proliferated, um, and now the the business models are evolving. So you got business model action, technical yes. changes, cultural people changes. All those theaters are exploding with opportunity, but also challenges. Yes. What's your take on that as you look at that world? You know. I'm a change junkie, I think. So I love I love when things are changing. I love when organizations are changing and companies are coming apart and coming together. Um, so for me, I feel like I've been, again, so fortunate I'm in the perfect place. But uh, you know, one of the things that um, I really prided myself on early in my career is being what I call the bridge or the, um, the translator between the different lines of business folks that I would work with, whether it was head of marketing or you know, somebody in a sales or a customer relationship or service organization, and the technology teams that I built and led. And I think I've had a natural curiosity about what makes a business tick, and, and not so much over-indexing on the technology itself. So technology's gonna come and go, there's gonna be different flavors, but actually how to really t take advantage of that technology to better engage your customers, which, as you said, their needs and their demands are changing. Their expectations are so high. Um, they really set the pace now. Who would have thought that, you know, 10 years ago, we'd live in an environment where industries and businesses are changing because consumers have sort of set the bar on the way that we all want to interact, engage, communicate, buy, pay. Um, so that has huge impact on organizations. And, you know, I have a lot of empathy for large established enterprises that are challenged to make it through this transformation, this change that somehow they have to make. And I'm always, I always try to pay attention on like, which companies have done it? And I call out Microsoft, for example, as an example. I can, I can still remember several years ago being at a conference, I think it was Jeffrey Moore was speaking, and he had on one slide, here's all the companies in technology that have had you know, really large success leading up to, you know, the internet boom days, there'd be a recipe for the, you know, the four companies that would come together. I think it was Sun and, you know, Oracle and Microsoft. And, and then he said, now here's the companies of today and most young people coming out of college or getting computer science degrees won't use any of these, these old technology companies. But Microsoft proved us all wrong. But they did it focused on people, culture, being willing to say where they screwed up and where they're not going to focus anymore and part ways with those parts of their business and really focus on who are their customers, what are their customer needs. So I think there's something to be learned, you know, from those those changes they made. Um, 
And and I think it, the you know back to the tech whisperer, there's no excuse for an executive today not to at least understand the fundamentals of technology. So many decisions have to be made around investment, capital, hiring, investment in your people. That without that understanding, you're yeah. sort of operating blind. And this is the thing of what I love is impressed by the tech whisper article. You know, a play on the horse whisper of the yes. movie. Um, <laughs> that you're kind of whispering in the ears of leaders who won't admit that they're scared, but they're That's all right. scared. They are. They're all scared. Yeah. And so they need to get maybe it's cognitive dissonance around decision making or they might not trust their leader. They don't know That's what they're right. talking about. So this certainly is there. I would agree with that. But there's dynamics that play and I want to get your thoughts on this. Yeah. I think this plays into the tech whisperer. The trend we're seeing is the old days was the engineers are out coding away. You know, hey, they're out there coding away. Let it go to them coding away. Now with cloud, they're on the front lines. That's right. They're getting closer to the customer. The apps are in charge. They're dictating to the infrastructure what can be done. With data, almost every solution can be customized. That's right. There's no more general purpose, and these are things that we talk about, but this changes the personnel equation. Yes. Now you got engineering and product people talking to sales and marketing people, business people. And customers. They, they tend not to, they traditionally weren't going well. Yeah. Now they have to work well. Engineers want to work with the customers. This is kind of a new business practice. Now I'm a scared executive. Beth, what do I do? Yeah, that, What's uh, your thoughts on that dynamic? You know, I'm not sure I would have had insight in that if I hadn't had that opportunity to work at this little startup, which we were a digital native. And it was the first time I worked in an environment where we did true extreme programming, pair programming. We had really strong product leads and engineers. So we didn't have project managers, business analysts, a lot of things that I think enterprise IT tends to have because the, the folks you know, historically in an enterprise, the folks that are specifying the need, the business need, are folks in the lines of business. And they're not product managers. Um, and even product managers, I say in banking, for example, they aren't software product managers. Um, and so that change, if you really do want to embrace these new methods and DevOps and a lot of the automation that's available to engineering and software development organizations today, um, you'd really do have to make that change. Otherwise, it's just going to be a clumsy version of what you used to do with yeah. a new name on it. Yeah. Um, the other thing, though, that I would say that is I don't want to discount for large enterprises is partnerships with startup companies or other tech partners. You don't need to build everything. Like, there's so much great technology out there. You, you brought up the cloud. You know, look at how rich these cloud stacks are getting. You know, it's not just now, can you provision me some compute and some storage and, and, and help me connect, you know, to, to the internet. There's some pretty sophisticated capabilities in there around AI and machine learning and data management um, and analysis. And so I think over time we'll see, you know, richer and richer cloud stacks that enables, you know, every company to benefit from the technology innovation that's going on right now. Andy Jassy, the CEO of Amazon Web Services, always says whenever I've interviewed him, and he always talks publicly now about it, is, you know, two pizza teams. Yes. And um, automate the undifferentiated heavy lifting. Yes. You know, in tech, we all know what that is. Yes. <laughs> the boring, Packing. mundane, patching, yeah. provisioning, <laughs> da -da -da -da. <laughs> and deploying more creative resources. So, okay, I believe that. I'm, yeah. and I'm a big believer of, of that philosophy. But it opens up the role, question of the roles of the people, yeah. that lonely DBA that you yeah. once were, yeah. and did some DBA work myself, yeah. system admin, storage administrator. Yes. These were roles, yeah. network administrator, the, the sacred you know, the god of the network. They, they ran everything. Yeah. They're evolving to be much more coding oriented, software driven yeah. changes. This it's is huge change. And you know, one thing I think is sad is uh, I, I run into folks often that are I'll just say technology professionals, just say, you know, writ large, who are out of work, you know, who, who um, sort of hang their head, you know, they, they're not valued or maybe there's some ageism involved or, or I think they get marked as, oh, that's old school, you know, they're not going to change. So uh, I, I really do believe we're at a point where there's not enough resources out there. And so how we invest in, in talent that's available today and help people through this change, not everybody's going to make it, mm -hmm. right? Not yeah. everybody, you, you it starts with you, yeah. right? Knowing yourself and how open-minded you are, are you willing to learn? Yeah. You know, are you willing to put some effort for, forth in, in sort of figuring out some of these new operating models? Because that's just essential if you want to be part of the future. And I'll tell you, it's hard and it's exhausting. So yeah. I, don't, I don't say this lightly, you know, when I just think, 
you know, about my career, how many changes and twists and turns there have been, um, sometimes you're just like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to just go hiking. <laughs> yeah. It's, it can be, well, there's a lot of institutional um, baggage yes. associated with the role you had. I've heard that before. Old guard, old school. That's right. We don't do that. Yo, you're way too old for that. Uh, we need more women, so let's yes. get women in. And yes. so, like, there's a big dynamic around that. And and and, and I want to get your thoughts on this because you mentioned ageism. Yes. And also, women in tech is also yes. growing. There's a need for that. So, yes. so there's more opportunities now than ever. I mean, you go to cybersecurity job boards. There are more jobs for cybersecurity experts than any. Oh, I'll tell you. Board. Yesterday, we held an event at our office in in partnership, you know, with with some uh, different startups, because that's one of the things you do when you're in a corporate venture group. And uh, it was all on the future of authentication. So it was really targeted at an audience of information security professionals and chief information security officers. And it was 20 men and one woman. And I thought, wow, you know, I'm used to that from having been a CIO that, you know, a lot of the infrastructure roles in particular, like as you were saying, yeah. the rack and stack and the storage management and the network folks just tend to be more male dominated than I think the product managers, designers, even software engineers to some extent. But here, you know, how many times can you go online and see how many openings there are for that type of role? So I personally am not pursuing that type of role, so I don't know what all the steps would need to be to, mm -hmm. to get educated, get certified, but boy, is there a need, and that need's not going to go away, right? As more, if everything is digitized and everything is online, then every you know security is going to be a constant concern and, and sort of a d dynamic. Well, space. we interview a lot of women in tech, um, and great to have you on. You're a great leader. We also uh, interview a lot of people that are older. Mm -hmm. I totally believe that there's an ageism issue out there. I've seen I do it too. firsthand, uh, maybe because I'm I'm over fifty, but um, and also women in tech. There's more coming in, not enough, and the numbers speak for themselves. But there's also an opportunity if you look at the leveling up. I mean, I talked to a, um, a person who was a network engineer, kind of same, hanging his yep. head, him, hanging mm -hmm. his head down. And he and I said, do you realize that networking paradigm is very similar to how cyber works? Yes. So a lot of the old is coming so back. Related. So if you look at like what was in the computer science programs in the 80s, it was a systems thinking. Yes. The systems thinking is coming back. So I see that as a great yes. opportunity. But also the aperture of the field of computer science is changing. So it's not... There are some areas that, frankly, women are better than men at, in, yep. my, in my opinion. Yep. You know, maybe get some, some crap for that. But, but the point, <laughs> I do believe that. And there are different roles. So I think there's not just, there's so much more here. Oh, that's so I what think I try to tell people. It's not just coding, right? There's, there's, a, there's so many different types of roles. Um, and, and unfortunately, I think we, we, I don't know, we don't market ourselves well. And, and so I encourage everyone out there that yeah. knows somebody <laughs> <laughs> if, someone was provision, if someone career. was doing Sun Microsystem mini computers or workstations, probably has a systems background that could pour, be a cloud administrator That's or a cloud right. architect. That's right. It's the same concepts. So I want to get your thoughts on women in tech since you're here. Yeah. Um, what's your thoughts on the industry? How's it going? Things that you advise other folks, men and women, that they could do differently? Any good signs? What's your thoughts in general? Yeah. So. Um, First of all, I'm just a big advocate for women in general and young young girls and, and young women just getting into the workforce and always have been. I have to say, again, very fortunate early in my career working for companies like the phone company and, and Schwab, we had so many amazing female leaders and I don't even think we had a program. You know, it was just sort of part of the DNA of the company. And it's really only in the last couple of years that I, I really see we have a big problem, whether it's reading about some of the cultures of, of some of the big tech companies or even spending more time in, in the Valley. And, and I think there's no one answer. It's multifaceted. It's, it's education, it's, it's families, it's, you know, each one of us could make a difference in how we hire, how, you know, sort of checking in on what our unintended biases are. Um, I know at City right now, there's a huge program around diversity and inclusion, gender and otherwise. And you know, one of the ways that I think it's going to be impactful is they've set targets. I know that are controversial, um, but it holds people accountable to, to make decisions and invest in developing people and, give, and making sure there's a pipeline, a talent that can step up into even bigger roles 
with a more diverse leadership team. So it, mind it share is super important. It will take time, though. It will take time. But mind share is a critical. It absolutely aspect is. Self awareness, <laughs> <laughs> community awareness. Yeah, very much so. What could men do differently? It's always about women in tech. What what can well, you know, men do? I think it's a great question, and I would um, I would say women can do this too. Like this, I, I hate when I see like a group together and it's all women working on the women issue. And it, shame on us for not inviting men into the into the organization. And then I think it's similar to the tech whisperer. Yeah. Don't be nervous, don't be worried, like just step in. Because, uh, you know, men are fathers, right? Yeah. Men are leaders, yeah. <laughs> men are colleagues, they're brothers, they're uncles. Like, yeah. we have to work on this together. I had a great guest, a friend that I was interviewing, and she's amazing. And, and she says, John, it's not diversity and inclusion. It's inclusion and diversity. It's yes. I and D, not D and I. I'm like, first of all, what's, what's D and I? I'm like, typical. My, great, my point exactly. <laughs> inclusion is not just the diversity piece. That's inclusion right. Inclusion first is inclusive in general. That's right. Diversity is a different. So you don't, people tend to blend them. Yes, they do. And That's or, your point. Or, That's forget, or even forget the inclusion part. Yeah, inclusive is yeah. key. Final question, uh, since you're a change junkie, which I love that <laughs> phrase, I'm kind of one myself. Um, change junkies are always chasing that next wave. Yeah, yeah. And you love waves. Pat Gelsinger at VMware, wave junkie. I always love talking with him. And he's a great wave spotter, and he sees them early. There's a big set of waves coming in now. Pretty clear, cloud's done its thing. It's only going to change and get bigger, hybrid, private, multi-cloud. That's right. Data, AI, 20-year cycle coming. What waves are you most excited about? What's out there? What waves are obvious? What waves aren't that you see? Yeah, oh, that's a tough one because we, we try to track what those waves are. I think um, one of the things that I'm seeing is as we all get, and I don't just mean people, I mean things, everything is, is connected and everything has some kind of smarts, some kind of uh, small CPU sensor. There's no way that our existing sort of network infrastructure and the way we connect and talk can support all of that. And so I think we're going to see some kind of discontinuous change where new models are going to are going to absolutely be required because we'll sort of hit the limit of how much traffic can go over the internet and how many devices can we manage and how much automation can the people in an enterprise sort of uh, oversee and monitor and secure and protect. Um, that's the thing that I, 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 I feel like it's a tsunami about to hit us. <laughs> and it's, yeah. it's going to be one of these perfect storms. And, and luckily, I think there is innovation going on around 5G and edge computing and, and different ways to think about securing the enterprise that will help, yeah. but it couldn't come soon enough. And model also meaning not just technical business, Absol operating model, oh, absolutely. people model. Machine to machine. Like whose identity is on there that's taken an action on your behalf or the company's behalf? You yeah. know, we see that already with yeah. RPA, these software robots. Who's making sure, you know, that they're doing what they're supposed to do? And they're so easy to create, now you have thousands of them. Yeah. In my mind, it's just more software to manage. I had a great question with Carl Eschenbach, former VMware CEO, now at Sequoia, he's on the board of UiPath. They're on the front page of Forbes today, talk about bots. Yes, 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 I've this, heard them speak. This is an issue, like, is there a verification? Is there a fake bots coming? If yeah. fake news, yep. fake bots are probably going to come too, to Absolutely point. they will. <laughs> this is this is a reality. No, oh, and 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 we're putting them in the hands of of non engineers to build these bots, <laughs> <laughs> which there's good and bad, right? Yeah, regulation and policy are two different things, and they could work together. This is going to be mm -hmm. probably a seminal issue for our industry: is yes. understand the societal impact, tech for good, shaping the technologies. That's this right. is what a tech whisperer has to do. You you have a tough job ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. Beth, thank you for coming on the Thank program. you for Appreciate having it. me. I'm John Furrier here for the People First Network here in Sand Hill Road at Mayfield as part of theCUBE and SiliconANGLE's co-creation with Mayfield Fund. Thanks for watching. <laughs>